Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our cardio webinar, Heart Health and the Science of Sleep. I'm Dr. Uh, Michael Constant, the principal investigator of the Ohio Cardiovascular and Diabetes Health Collaborative, also known as Cardio. And I'm joined by Dr. Sherry Bolin, co-principal investigator for Cardio. Founded in 2017, Cardio's mission is to improve cardiovascular and diabetes health outcomes and eliminate disparities in Ohio's Medicaid population. Cardio brings together Ohio's seven medical schools to identify, produce, and disseminate evidence-based cardiovascular and diabetes best practices to primary care teams. To learn more about the collaborative and to access our online repository of best practices, please visit our website, cardio.org. I would like to acknowledge and uh, thank our sponsor, the Ohio Department of Medicaid, and our administrative partner, the Ohio Colleges of Medicine Government Resource Center. I would also like to recognize the partnership of Ohio's seven medical schools who contribute to make the Cardio Collaborative a success. Dr. Bolin will now provide some details regarding today's webinar. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a few logistics. Um, your name on Zoom should be uh, displayed and containing your first and last name. So please change that if you uh, notice that your name is not on there. If you're joining as a group, please use the chat feature to record names and emails of all the attendees that are in your group. And we do want you to submit questions. So please use the Q&A feature to submit questions at any point during the webinar. And we will answer those during the Q&A portion near the end of the webinar. And we do want your feedback, so we will send a post-webinar evaluation survey to get your input. Uh, we have no disclosures for this webinar to report. And if you want to claim CME, um, you do need to be registered, so you can use this QR code or there'll be a link as well to just register and then claim um, or state if you're interested. There'll be a checkbox to state if you're interested in claiming CME. And then we will send you a CME evaluation form so that you can claim credits. So with that, I will go ahead and introduce Dr. Amy Zach. She is our moderator today for our webinar. Um, she is a family medicine physician and vice chair of education at the Cleveland Clinic and faculty at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. And Dr. Zach also serves as the head of education dissemination for cardio. So delighted to have her introduce our wonderful speaker today and get us started. Thanks, Amy. Thanks so much, Sherry. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jennifer Milano, who is an associate professor at the University of Cincinnati, where she's been on faculty since 2010. She completed both medical school and neurology residencies in her home state of, at West Virginia University. Dr. Milano received further training in behavioral neurology at the Mayo Clinic and in sleep medicine at Vanderbilt University. Her interests within neurology include the interface between sleep and cognition, serving as editor and on boards for the American Academy of Neurology and numerous other institutions. Dr. Milano ha also has a great interest in physician wellness, serving on multiple wellness initiatives with the Academy of Neurology, Ohio State Medical Association, as well as chairing physician and graduate medical education wellness committees at the University of Cincinnati. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Jennifer Milano to talk about sleep and its impact on cardiovascular disease. Thank you very much, Dr. Zach, for the introduction. And Thank you all for the honor and pleasure of presenting with you all here today. Our learning objectives are to identify the cardiovascular implications of sleep conditions, screen patients at risk for sleep conditions, and how do we counsel our patients to optimize their sleep health. To provide a little bit of context, let's talk a little bit about what exactly is sleep. I like to tell people that sleep is a necessity, it is not a luxury. But what it does is it's this idea of a reversible behavioral state of perceptual disengagement from an unresponsiveness to the environment. So basically it's our brain and our body's way of unplugging from all of the work that we're doing on a daily basis. Now, there are many reasons that we sleep and we'll talk a little bit more about the reasons from a heart health perspective, it's important to sleep. But we do need to sleep well in order to perform well and to feel well throughout our day. 
some of the theories behind this is that it is an opportunity for us to conserve our metabolic energy. And what we do know is that we do spend about 15% less um, energy expenditure during sleep than quiet wakefulness. It's also important for cognition. So what we know is that if we are not sleeping well, meaning that we're sleep deprived either due to not having enough sleep or having poor quality of sleep, we have challenges with our intellectual performance. We have difficulties with memory consolidation. Um, and in addition to that, it's very important in terms of regulation of multiple body functions in our temperature and homeostatic systems. In the past 10 years or so, there's also been a lot of evidence saying that sleep is essential for brain health, potentially even from a preventative standpoint for progressive neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's disease. So one of the newer functions that's been discovered about sleep is this idea that sleep helps to sweep toxins from the brain, which again, as we mentioned before, does have potential implications in terms of conditions such as Alzheimer's disease. So this slide basically talks about the fact in, that sleep affects every single system in our body, our endocrine system, our respiratory system, our cardiovascular system, which of course we'll talk a little bit more in detail, um, but even our GI system and our renal system and um, our homeostatic systems are involved as well. And sleep health is so important that the American Heart Association recently included sleep health as a part of life's essential eight um, in terms of optimizing cardiovascular health. So again, sleep is a necessity. It's not a luxury. Um, and it's important for us to emphasize that not only for our patients, but also for ourselves. Now, in terms of mechanisms that drive our sleep-wake cycle, I like to tell my patients that we have two cycles or two processes that tend to be associated with that. Number one is our homeostatic sleep drive. And number two is our internal clock or our circadian rhythm. Um, and so these two processes work in concert together to help us determine whether or not we're supposed to fall asleep, when we're supposed to fall asleep, and when we're supposed to wake up. And again, what I tell my patients is that assuming that someone has an adequate amount of sleep and adequate quality of sleep, when we first wake up in the morning, our homeostatic sleep drive, which is driven by adenosine, tends to be weakest when we first wake up in the morning and gets stronger and stronger and stronger throughout the day until our internal clock, which is conducted by our suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus, tells us to go to sleep at night. So again, these two processes work in concert in order to tell us when we're supposed to sleep and when we're supposed to wake up. Now, there's even more in terms of sleep neurobiology. And this slide is more of uh, an opportunity to just appreciate the fact that there are multiple neurotransmitter systems that are involved not only with wakefulness, but also in terms of uh, sleep and the different stages of sleep. In summary, what we know is that the monoaminergic neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine, dopamine, histamine, serotonin as examples are important for wakefulness. GABA is important for sleep. Um, and acetylcholine is also important for wakefulness as well. And these all kind of interplay with each other, again, to, in order to tell us whether or not we're awake and whether or not we're asleep and what stage of sleep we might be in. So how is sleep organized? Most people know that we have non-REM sleep and we have REM sleep. So REM sleep stands for rapid eye movement sleep. When we're dividing between non-REM and REM sleep, in terms of non-REM sleep, we have um, what we call N1, N2, or N3 sleep in the sleep world, otherwise known as the lighter, intermediate, or deeper stages of sleep. And REM sleep tends to be our dream state sleep, where our eyes are very active, but our arms and legs are paralyzed. One sleep cycle going from the various stages of non-REM sleep to REM sleep lasts about 90 to 110 minutes. It tends to be repeated about four to six times per night. And we have our largest percentage of sleep during the first part of the night. And our greatest amount of REM sleep tends to be towards war as the night progresses. So again, more towards that 
time when we're about to wake up. Young adults spend about 50 to 60% of the night in stage N2 sleep. REM is about 20% of the night and stage N3 or that deeper stages of sleep is associated with about 15 to 20% of the night. On the right-hand side of the slide here, what you see are um, three schematics of uh, what you might see um, in one night. So on the x-axis is the number of hours in bed, on the y-axis are the different stages of sleep. And what you can see here is that our sleep can change throughout the lifespan. So as an example, in children, we have the highest percentage of our slow wave sleep. As adults, we tend to have less slow wave sleep as we were when we were children. And then in older adults, what happens is that as a part of the normal aging process, we have less slow wave sleep and more nighttime awakenings. So how much sleep exactly do we need? And so the National Sleep Foundation recommends for people between the ages of 18 to 65 or 64 that they have seven to nine hours of sleep. For adults 65 and older, the recommendation is seven to eight hours of sleep. And you can see here that the sleep requirements change and actually are um, increased with children from infancy state until being school-aged or as a teenager. So what exactly happens if someone doesn't sleep well? Two of the common symptoms that we see in the sleep clinic is that people may be too sleepy during the day, or they may sleep for an excessive amount of time, otherwise known as hypersomnia um, or hypersomnolence, or they may have difficulties falling asleep or staying asleep, otherwise known as insomnia. We see other conditions as well, but these are two of the common ones that we see. In terms of a general approach to sleep issues, we again ask for the quantity of and duration of sleep that they might have, the perception of sleep quality, and we delve more deeply into their sleep schedule in terms of what time they go to bed, what time they wake up, how long it takes for them to fall asleep, how many times they wake up in the middle of the night, and how long it takes for them to fall back asleep, and whether or not they nap during the day. And that can be both intentional and unintentional naps. We have a lot of different things that we ask about. Caffeine, alcohol, drug use, of course, past medical history, past surgical history. We look at medications because as we talked about, there are a lot of neurotransmitters that are associated with sleep and wakefulness. And so medications may contribute to that. So life or social stressors may contribute, especially if you're given a history of insomnia. And we do have a review of systems in terms of looking at sleep specific symptoms, including snoring, dry mouth, morning headache, nasal congestion for um, obstructive sleep apnea, as an example. Um, and we also look for other factors that may contribute to sleep as well. Our general approach is to look at it from five different aspects. So number one, does someone have a primary sleep disorder? What are the psychiatric and psychosocial factors contributing? What are the medical factors contributing? And then medications, and if there's a circadian misalignment. Some of the screening tools that can be used for sleep issues include this Are You Sated uh, questionnaire, which focuses on sleep health, the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, which focuses primarily on daytime sleepiness. It can be a, a tool to screen for possible sleep apnea, as well as uh, central. Uh, central disorders of hypersomnolence, such as narcolepsy. And then there are OSA or obstructive sleep apnea specific screening tools, such as the Berlin questionnaire and the stop bang questionnaire that can be used as well. So again, it's important to address sleep issues because from a brain health perspective, of course I'm a neurologist, so I focus on this, it's important for brain health. If we don't sleep well, we have slower response times, reduced flexible thinking. We also know that it can contribute to mental health issues and again, may have impl implications for cognitive difficulties over time as well. But why is it also important for us to address, address this in terms of cardiovascular effects? And we'll talk about all of these different aspects. We'll talk about sleep duration, insomnia, how sleep and blood pressure interplay with each other. And then we'll focus on three specific sleep disorders, including obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, and shift work disorder. And we'll conclude by talking about ways that we can optimize our sleep. In terms of sleep duration, and again, remember that the National Sleep Foundation recommends seven to nine hours of sleep for people between the ages of 18 and 65. 
and seven to eight hours of sleep for those over the age of 65. We know that there is a U-shaped effect um, and this is based off of meta-analyses of uh, multiple prospective cohort studies and how they defined sleep, normal sleep ranged from six hours to about 8.9 hours. Uh, most of them focused on the eight, seven to eight hours of sleep. What we know of that is that if the duration of sleep is short, it, it can increase the risk for mortality, increase the risk for incident diabetes and obesity, increase the risk for cor coronary heart disease, and also increase the risk for cardiovascular disease and hypertension. In terms of long duration, it can also increase the risk for all-cause mortality and also increase the risk for incident diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and coronary artery disease, and also can be associated with an increased risk for stroke. This cohort, the CARDIA cohort, and CARDIA stands for Coronary Artery Risk Development in Young Adults, has looked at whites and, and blacks between the ages of 18 to 30, and their initial cohort was back in 1985, 1986. And so what they did was that they had people complete a sleep questionnaire, as well as actigraphy, which is similar to um, those trackers where you can monitor sleep-wake cycles based on movement. And they also had people take get and get and obtain a standard CT chest. And what they found was that the odds of incident coronary calcification was inversely related to the number of hours of sleep. So if you had less sleep, you had an increased likelihood of coronary calcification. An extra hour of sleep decreased the estimated odds of calcifications by 33%. And in various modeling methods, what they found was that an extra hour of sleep nightly was equal to a modeled effect of about 16 and a half um, pressure drop in your systolic blood pressure. Now, in terms of insomnia, we talked about how a lot of times people come in um, having difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or another thing way that we look at it is also early morning awakenings. In this other prospective cohort, the health professionals follow-up study, Insomnia complaints were associated with less physical activity, higher body mass index, an increased prevalence of depression, hypertension, high cholesterol, triglycerides, diabetes, myocardial infarction, and stroke. Frequent sleep onset insomnia, so again, difficulty falling asleep, was associated with a 55% increased risk of cardiovascular disease mortality, particularly myocardial infarction. Uh, but there was no increased risk for difficulty necessarily maintaining sleep or early morning awakenings. So what are some of the physiologic mechanisms that may be contributing to this? I think taking a step back and looking at normal sleep, one of the things to consider is that we tend to have what we call a normal dipping me mechanism or process of our blood pressure. And just as a reminder, with, we have different stages of sleep. Slow wave sleep is associated with N3 sleep. Um, and so it is associated with, again, slow wave sleep and also an increased parasympathetic response. So you have increased vagal tone with decreased sympathetic activity. And as a result of that, we have lower heart rates and lower blood pressures during that time. During REM sleep, we have a little bit more sympathetic activity so that it can be a little bit more variable. Um, and we tend to believe, and studies have shown, that our, our blood pressure tends to dip about 10 milligrams of pressure uh, uh, during sleep. And that's known as the normal dipping phenomenon. On the right-hand side, what you see here, um, again, is this hypnogram of the number of hours of sleep on the x-axis and the different stages of sleep on the y-axis. And what you can see is that the mean arterial blood pressure tends to dip during the first half of the night where slow wave sleep is more prominent and may um, increase a little bit back towards its baseline uh, during the latter half of the night during REM sleep. So again, a normal physiologic phenomenon. If people do not dip, if they are non-dippers, or if they are what we call reverse dippers, where they have nocturnal hypertension, this is associated with um, more, is more predictive of cardiovascular morbidity than daytime readings. So I think the idea here on the right 
is that you have your dippers on the third line here, and the non-dippers and the reverse dippers have an increased risk of um, incidence of cardiovascular disease over time. And then another study that kind of looks again at high blood pressure and um, especially slow wave sleep has shown that um, in this longitudinal cord a study of males over the age of 67, males who were normotensive at baseline and um, had significantly less slow wave sleep were more likely to develop incident hypertension over a follow-up of three to 3.5 years. Um, and so again, I think this idea that sleep and slow wave sleep can be important in terms of the mechanisms that are associated with high blood pressure. Now, in terms of sleep conditions and um, cardiovascular conditions, let's talk a little bit about obstructive sleep apnea. And of course, I think most of us know here that hypertension and obstructive sleep apnea have a bi-directional relationship. So in those with hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea or OSA can be seen in about 30% of those who are hypertensive and 80% of those who have drug-resistant hypertension. We also know that untreated obstructive sleep apnea increases the risk for hypertension, um, and that risk can vary depending on the severity. So in mild obstructive sleep apnea, and how we define that in the sleep world is an apnea hypopnea index of five to 15 events per hour. Untreated obstructive sleep apnea is associated with an 18% increased risk. Um, of hypertension. And then in severe obstructive sleep apnea, where people have an apnea hypopnea index of more than 30 events per hour, it's an even greater risk. And as one might suspect, because with obstructive sleep apnea, you have a lot of um, obstructions and arousals at night, uh, it, it doesn't allow us to get into that normal dipping pattern for blood pressure. And so it is associated with um, elevated nocturnal hypertension or reverse dipping, and also the severity of sleep apnea and the increased severity of sleep apnea can be associated with um, increase, that increased uh, dipping pattern. We also know that obstructive, severe obstructive sleep apnea is associated with an eightfold risk of poorly controlled blood pressure in Blacks, and that non-dippers, again, as we mentioned, have an increased risk for a lot of these cardiovascular uh, issues that people may have, including stroke and all cause, cause mortality. And treatment for obstructive sleep apnea, which we'll discuss later, may also de decrease blood pressure as well. So in brief, what sleep apnea is, is that it is seen in about 5% of the population, but can be um, seen in more people, especially as we get older. It's associated with snoring, daytime sleepiness, morning headaches, and a dry mouth. What we know is that with obstructive sleep apnea is that we have a blockage of our airway. So this is a schematic here on the left-hand side where someone has an open airway and people are able to breathe in um, and fill their lungs as they should. And then those with the blocked airway, there you can see here that the tongue sometimes can block the airway and cause people to have obstructions of their airway. And so if people have a partial obstruction, it can cause snoring. If it's a complete obstruction, it can cause an apnea. We evaluate obstructive sleep apnea with a sleep study. This is an example of polysomnography or a comprehensive in-lab study where we actually have people physically spend the night at our sleep center and there are different sensors, not only to look at respiratory effort, but also to look at sleep staging with an, um, an EEG. Uh, and also looking at limb leads and chin leads to kind of determine what stage of sleep that they might be in. A home sleep apnea test is something that can be done at home. Uh, the advantage of it is the convenience. Uh, it only focuses on the respiratory parameters that we look for for obstructive sleep apnea, so it doesn't allow for us to determine what stage of sleep that they might be in. In terms of the relationship between sleep apnea and cardiovascular risk, what we know is that there are many things that can contribute to airway patency. So first of all, was someone born with a more crowded airway or not? Um, neuromuscular co uh, compensation. So um, you know, are they more likely due to obesity or what have you to have airway collapse? And then this idea of arousal threshold. So are they more likely to wake up if something were to happen? Um, and then what's that response? 
All of those can contribute to airway patency. All of those can contribute to um, abnormal breathing events, including apneas or hypopneas. Um, and while how we define a hypopnea is there is a partial closing of the airway. Um, and for Medicaid and Medicare, it's associated with a 4% drop of the oxygen saturations um, as one example. And then you can get as a result of that hypoxic burden um, in challenges in terms of um, the arousal systems and the cardiovascular response. So you can have more irregularities of the heart rate. So you can have what we call tachybradycardia sort of events where they slow down and increase, the heart rate increases. And that can cause over time a lot of challenges with inflammation, oxidative stress, blood pressure dysregulation, which can lead to the cardiovascular challenges that we see with obstructive sleep apnea. And of course, sex, obesity, and genetics all can contribute to the factors that um, underlie this relationship between obstructive sleep apnea and cardiovascular risk. Now talking about other conditions outside of high, high blood pressure, diabetes, in addition to hypertension, has this birelational relationship with obstructive sleep apnea. OSA is very common in those with diabetes. It's associated with an increased risk for diabetes. And it has been, if obstructive sleep apnea is untreated, it has been associated with increased diabetic complications. So this includes peripheral neuropathy, retinopathy, and nephropathy as well. CPAP or the treatment um, for sleep apnea, continuous positive airway pressure may improve glycemic control. But I think the caveat, especially if you're reading studies that look at CPAP and, and outcomes is really understanding the compliance rate um, for this. So um, of, their, of, their, of their usage. So um, the improvement with glycemic control has been seen, especially if it's used or CPAP is used more than six hours a night. In terms of coronary artery disease, um, again, similar to sleep duration, obstructive sleep apnea has been associated with an increased um, coronary artery calcium scores and increases the risk for coronary artery disease. And the reason for the mixed results on the effects of CPAP on decreasing um, that risk for uh, uh, coronary artery disease is again associated with compliance. And in terms of sleep apnea and stroke, we know that obstructive sleep apnea is associated with an increased risk for stroke. And um, in males in particular, severe obstructive sleep apnea was as associated with a threefold increased risk for stroke. Treatment for sleep apnea may decrease stroke risk and may also improve neurological outcomes in those with stroke. So other sleep conditions. Let's talk about restless leg syndrome. So by definition, this is a clinical diagnosis. Someone needs to fulfill all four criteria in order to make that diagnosis. So it is number one, an urge to move the legs. Number two, at night. Number three, that's worse at rest. And number four, that's better with movement. And um, the symptoms should be associated with functional difficulties. Now, the epidemiological data between restless leg syndrome and cardiovascular disease tends to be, has, has been mixed. Some have said yes, some have said no. Um, a lot of them it ha has also been associated with other comorbidities such as end-stage renal, renal disease, peripheral vascular disease, and diabetes uh, as examples. And some of the thought is that the mechanism may be due to an increased sympathetic nervous activation that may contribute to that. And this slide is one that kind of discusses or compares how these mechanisms may parallel obstructive sleep apnea. So on the left-hand side, obstructive sleep apnea can be associated with intermittent hypoxia and hypercapnia, sleep fragmentation and de uh, sleep deprivation that can ultimately lead, lead to vascular injury um, through uh, potentially hypertension and other mechanisms leading to cardiovascular disease. On the right-hand side, restless leg syndrome may be associated with um, sleep deprivation because people have difficulty falling asleep at night, but it also may be associated with sleep fragmentation associated with periodic limb movements of sleep. Um, some of the mechanisms that have had some evidence to support it 
include uh, this idea of sleep augmentation to, through periodic movements of sleep, leading to vascular injury, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. Um, how iron deficiency, which is important uh, for dopamine production and with restless leg syndrome, we have a, a, a dip in dopamine at night um, and oxidative stress contributes to this mechanism um, still is in need of development. Now, in terms of periodic movements of sleep in the sleep world, we have very strict criteria in terms of what constitutes a periodic movement of sleep. On the right-hand side, there's a graphic that indicates what we might see um, on a sleep study. It is very commonly seen in those with restless leg syndrome, um, but again, it is not necessary in order to make the diagnosis of restless leg syndrome. Um, but those who have restless legs, about 80% of those, 80 to 90% of those with restless legs have periodic limb movements of sleep. On the other hand, people can have periodic limb movements of sleep without having restless leg syndrome. And it could be due to other factors such as medications, um, other medical conditions such as peripheral neuropathy as, as an example. But there have been some studies that have shown that periodic limb movements of sleep on a sleep study can have cardiovascular effects. And this is one study that looked at a small number of folks with restless legs and healthy, healthy controls. And what they found was that periodic limb movements were associated with increased heart rate and blood pressure um, and were more prominent in those who have microarousals um, and that the cardiovascular effects uh, tended to be more increased with those with restless leg syndrome. And finally, we'll talk about in terms of this, this relationship between sleep and cardiovascular risk, we'll talk about um, one specific circadian rhythm disorder called shift work disorder. But as you recall, we talked about the fact that our sleep-wake cycle is driven by um, a, a two-process model, our homeostatic sleep drive to help us um, get that get stronger throughout the day and helps us fall asleep at night. And then our circadian alerting a signal that's conducted by the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus that when it is dark outside releases melatonin through the pineal gland and allows us to fall asleep. On the right hand side, what you see are some of the common circadian rhythm conditions that we see in the clinic. Delayed sleep phase syndrome often seen in teenagers are our um, folks who are extreme night owls. Advanced sleep phase syndrome um, it, where people are extreme morning larks uh, tend to be seen in older adults. Those who have an irregular sleep-wake rhythm where they may sleep for two hours at a time, but may have overall in a 24-hour period, eight hours of sleep are seen often in those with, are often seen in those with uh, underlying neurological conditions such as dementia. And then those with a non 24 hour sleep wake rhythm um, are typically seen when people uh, have blindness or don't have a ability to see. Shift workers are very common in our uh, Medicaid population. We also have a lot of people in this population who um, have to work two jobs in order to make ends meet. And what we do know is that shift work has been seen and been associated with it again, an increased risk for myocardial infarction, stroke, and coronary events. It also has been associated with an increased risk for breast cancer. Um, and we think that it may have a dose-response rela dose relationship um, associated with the increased risk or years of shift work. And similar to one we talked about before, the fact that normally what happens is that our blood pressure drops by about by about 10 points is that our shift workers more, may be more likely to have a non-dipping blood pressure pattern. And as a result of that, may be at an increased risk for higher systolic and diastolic blood pressures as well. I hope that I have made the argument that not only is sleep a necessity for overall health, but I hope that I've given some evidence that sleep is also important for heart health. So let's spend the last few minutes that, um, of talking about how we can optimize our sleep. So in terms of sleep duration, I think the education piece of, again, emphasizing that it is recommended that people get seven to nine hours of sleep between the ages of 18 and 65, and seven to eight hours of sleep over the age of 65 is important. We'll talk a little bit about cognitive behavioral um, treatments for insomnia, but it has had good long-term results in both primary insomnias and insomnias associated with 
various disease um, conditions. So cancer, depression, uh, rheumatologic conditions, among many others. Now, in terms of medications, we tend to recommend them ideally for acute insomnia. So for ideally, again, the first three or six months after uh, an acute event that might be causing insomnia. In some situations, chronic intermittent use may be beneficial, um, especially if they're comorbid conditions such as depression or seizures as an example. But we do know that the behavioral treatments result in more sustained benefits over time. And I do emphasize the non-medication strategies um, strategies in my sleep or, or in my sleep clinic, because a lot of times what people have in their toolbox is their sleep hypnotic that was prescribed to them that they've been on for many years, and they don't have other tools to help them with sleep. So we try to work on that a little bit. In terms of cognitive behavioral therapy, the cognition piece of it is trying to identify and correct negative thinking associated with sleep. So trying to reframe their, their relationship with sleep. And then from a behavioral standpoint, it's the idea of practicing good sleep habits and then also altering their schedule and, and emphasizing a consistent sleep schedule to promote sleep. Now, I think one of the reasons that we emphasize the healthy sleep habits is that it's really all about that sleep-wake cycle. So the brain, and as a, as a result of that, the rest of the body likes routine. The brain likes to know when it's supposed to wake up, when it's supposed to go to sleep. In terms of our homeostatic sleep drive for sleep, again, that's driven by adenosine. And what we know is that two things that can directly weaken our signal to, to sleep at night are caffeine and taking naps during the day. So caffeine is an adenosine antagonist. Caffeine has a half-life of about three to five hours, depending on the individual. And so as a result of that, we tend to recommend no caffeine after two o'clock in the afternoon. In terms of naps, again, if you go back to that slide where that homeostasis sleep, sleep drive gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger throughout the day until we are told our brain tells us to go to sleep at night, if you are napping, the way that I frame it to my, my patients is that if you are napping during the day, and if it's prolonged more than 30, 30 minutes, you are directly stealing from your sleep at night and it can make it more challenging for you to fall asleep. So in terms of non-pharmacological strategies for insomnia, eliminate naps as much as possible. No caffeine after two o'clock in the afternoon try and maintain a consistent sleep schedule. I also recommend if you, if you can to have a bedtime routine to help you unwind about a half an hour to an hour before you're about to go to sleep. Keep the bedroom for sleep only. The reason that we recommend this is that the longer someone stays in bed, if they can't fall asleep, the more that they are training their brain that that's okay, and that actually can feed into insomnia. So 20 minutes is our cutoff. If there, someone is unable to fall asleep or stay asleep after 20 minutes, we recommend that they physically get out of bed, go into another room, and perform a relaxing, and as I told one of my patients, boring, non-engaging activity. Um, not looking at you know, YouTube videos or videos online or reading an engaging book like a mystery, which some of my folks have done. Relaxation training can also be helpful tensing and relaxing various muscles in the body. In terms of obstructive sleep apnea, again, first line treatment is continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. In terms of compliance for Medicaid and Medicare and most insurances, they want people to make, they want us to, to document when they see us back and follow up in the sleep clinic that someone has been wearing their CPAP device for at least four hours 70% of the time over a 30 day period. So 21 out of 30 days consecutively. Um, and so that's for insurance purposes, but for maximum health purposes, as we kind of talked about before, we do recommend using CPAP at all times when someone is sleeping at a bare minimum of six hours. Now we do have people who have difficulty tolerating CPAP. And so there are alternative treatments depending on the severity of the sleep apnea and various um, other conditions as well. 
An oral appliance, which is in the middle, is where a dentist makes impressions of the teeth, um, and they have a mouthpiece that pushes the lower jaw forward and opens up the airway spaces in the back. It is best for those who have mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea. So again, 15 to less than 30 events per hour. On the right-hand side, if someone has more sleep apnea during on their back, you can use positional therapy. Um, and this is a, an FDA cleared device um, that is one example of that. There are also some homegrown ways of doing it as well. And then there are surgical options on like, as such as the left-hand side, um, like a hypoglossal nerve stimulator that stimulates the nerve to the, to the tongue and protrudes the tongue forward. In terms of restless legs, non-pharmacological management, sometimes we check, a lot of times we check the iron status because again, iron is a cofactor for dopamine. Uh, we also recommend weaning or abstaining from caffeine and moderate but not intense exercise may be helpful. Medication management may include dopamine agonists, but the caveat with that is that it can cause impulse control issues and augmentation. So augmentation is where someone has restless leg sy symptoms earlier in the day, or it may spread to other parts of the body. Our alpha-2 delta calcium channel ligands may also be helpful. Um, and in refractory cases, we consider low-dose opioids. In terms of managing sleep in our shift workers, this is a nice infographic from the British Medical Journal um, from a few years ago. One of the things that we recommend is that because of that half-life life of caffeine is, is that we do recommend if you are going to consume caffeine or any sort of energy drink to do it during the first half of the shift. So then it allows that the body to completely wash it out. So when you're trying to go to sleep um, during, you know, when you're off, you're able to do that. Um, in addition to that, try to um, have and, and wear uh, um, shades. Um, or sunglasses when you're driving home from work. And then in between shifts and resetting after night shifts, there, there are some strategies as well. So I think, um, you know, trying to sleep in a dark, quiet room in between your shifts. Um, and then also when you're trying to reset after night shifts, like, so for example, if you have residents who are on call, try to have a, a longer nap immediately following, following the shift, try to stay outside and then try to go back to bed at a normal bedtime. So we'll conclude here by giving some, again, general tips to improve sleep, maintaining that consistent sleep schedule, optimizing treatment of medical and psychiatric conditions, reviewing the medication lists. Um, as one example, a common uh, medication that is prescribed by primary care physicians are beta blockers. Uh, the lipophilic beta blockers, such as propranolol, as an example, are more likely to decrease and lower melatonin levels at night and also may contribute to nightmares. So that's just something to keep in mind. Try to limit naps during the day. Try to eliminate caffeine use after 2 p.m. Avoid nicotine because nicotine, for many reasons, is not good, is not optimal for heart health, but is also very activating. So it's not good for sleep health either. And alcohol may help people fall asleep, but it wears off in the middle of the night and can cause um, more awakenings during the early morning hours before one is supposed to go wake up, in addition to the fact that it increases the risk for sleep apnea. Maintain that, that bedroom for um, nighttime activities only and try to keep a cool and comfortable environment. So I hope we've been able in this very short period of time to talk about sleep, why it's important, understand the cardiovascular implica implications of sleep conditions, find ways to screen patients at, at risk for sleep conditions and counsel on how we can optimize their sleep health. And um, one resource is sleepeducation.org, which is the patient-facing website for the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And with that, I say thank you. Sleep well. Thank you so much for um, that incredibly helpful discussion of sleep and cardiovascular implications. Um, we do have a few questions. I would like to invite anybody who has questions at this time to feel free to enter them in the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, and to get started, um, we have a question that states, would an oral supplement given in the morning improve or interfere with our wakefulness cycle or metabolism of adenosine? I'm imagining we're probably talking about maybe caffeine um, tablets and things like that. 
um, I think the general principle um, stays the same. So a lot of times when I have patients who come and see me, I explain to them it's more the timing of of um, the of the um, caffeine that we're concerned about as opposed to the amount. Um, I think there's some there's been some discussions about this with some of my colleagues. You know, if we wake up, say we wake up at 6:30 in the morning and we drink our caffeine, our, our adenosine antagonist or caffeine right away, right? Is it really making taking that full effect? Now, depending on how you slept the night before, it might have a little bit of effect, but sometimes taking it a little bit later in the morning might be a little bit helpful. So for me, as an example, I'll give an anecdote um, just based on my own life. So, um, you know, I tend to try to go to bed and my sleep schedule, I try to maintain it at like 10.30 to 6.30. It's an imperfect practice. Some, some nights are better than others. But um, I try to drink my caffeine. It kicks in for me a little bit better when it's around 9 or 10 o'clock. Are there negative cardiovascular effects to pulling an occasional all-nighter? I think in general, if it's more acute, you do have a chance of recovery. So as an example, if you are sleep deprived because you've pulled an all-nighter um, for one night, um, what we tend, you do get a, a little bit of a rebound effect. So during the first night of recovery, you tend to have recovery of slow wave sleep. During the second night of recovery, you tend to have um, recovery of um, your REM sleep. And so there is some ability to kind of bounce back from that, but I think it's definitely in more of the chronic situations where you'll have more of a, that increased risk. Have you seen evidence that Alzheimer's or dementia risks are increased with sleep apnea? Um, the short answer to that is yes. The longer answer to that, um, and, and just putting on my behavioral neurology hat on for, for just a minute, um, what we know about Alzheimer's disease is that there is um, a pre-symptomatic phase about 15 to 20 years prior to the onset of symptoms. And so during that time period, we tend to have um, an increase in buildup of amyloid in the brain. Um, and then when someone has to have develop symptoms, they have the, the tau pathology and neurofibrillary tangles that we can, can see that contribute to the memory conditions. Um, obstructive sleep apnea has been implicated um, in um, increasing the m amount of amyloid burden, particularly during the pre-symptomatic phase. It also is very common in, in um, people who have mild cognitive impairment and um, dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. And treatment uh, can help with that. We're hoping too that it may, hope to, it may help to slow the decline um, of, of symptoms, but that in the progression of Alzheimer's disease, but that is still um, a work in progress. Um, in our cognitive clinic, one of the reasons that I appreciate being a part of the UC system is that we have a very close relationship between our cognitive clinic and the sleep clinic, and they order sleep studies on the vast majority of their folks. And a lot of times they do have sleep apnea, um, and sometimes they may not necessarily uh, may not necessarily be sleepy, but they may have cognitive difficulties. So the longer answer is yes. The short answer, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is um, there's a lot of evidence uh, evolving with that. Can you discuss uh, the diagnosis of non-dippers and reverse dippers? Well, I think in terms of diagnosing it, I don't think that we have a way of actually diagnosing it in the clinic. So as an example, during a sleep study, we don't check their blood pressures every hour. Um, but so this is more, you know, where they've kind of noticed the, this, this change is more uh, on a research perspective. But what we do know is that, again, you can have a lot of heart rate variability um, in, in terms of um, what you see on a sleep study, um, particularly as it relates to um, um, obstructive events. Um, and then in addition to that, I think one other thing too is that, you know, if you treat someone with obstructive sleep apnea, their, their, their blood pressures, you know, during the daytime when you see them in clinic is better. But at, at least in terms of what we see clinically in a patient, um, we don't have any routine mechanism to identify whether or not someone is um, 
a non-dipper or a reverse dipper, but we do know the conditions that may contribute to that state. A couple questions on melatonin. Does it really help? What doses? Um, do you feel like it's beneficial for patients? That's a great and uh, great convert question, and also one that is up for much discussion. Um, again, just as a reminder, melatonin is released by the pineal gland um, with darkness um, as a part of our circadian rhythms or circadian or internal body clock. The challenge with melatonin is that um, it's a supplement, so it's not regulated. So you don't really know how much melatonin is in a supplement. Um, the consumer, I think, I believe it was Consumer Reports uh, that that had um, um, a an issue out about supplements a, a few years ago. Uh, talked about, you know, how do you find ways that there's been some sort of quality control? And one of the recommendations was to look, um, have people look at the label and see whether or not it has um, it's been reviewed by um, USP. Um, I think it's, I don't remember what USP stands for. I think it's like US Pharmacopedia or something like that. Um, but I think in terms of using it as a hypnotic, um, we tend to recommend it at lower doses. So no more than ideally one to five milligrams. Some people go up to 10 milligrams. In terms of timing, um, it's best if it's probably about an hour before bedtime. And the other thing to note is that it helps primarily with sleep onset. It doesn't help with sleep maintenance. So um, there's a lot of, again, discussion about that. Melatonin also has some other uses. Um, it can be used for, I, I think, to help with shifting. Um, people are, are extreme um, night owls or morning lights, light larks can help with shifting their sleep schedule to one that is you know, more conducive to societal functioning. Um, but again, there's a, there's a lot of discussion about that in terms of you know, how, it, how it's important and how it's used and how much to use. Um, so that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, is it true that Inspire, once it's surgically placed, cannot be removed? And um, how often are you seeing these implantable devices used overall? Um, I think it's, it is a, a very, um, it's a smaller group of people who do use it. Um, my understanding and talking with my ear, nose, and throat colleagues is that um, even though it's implanted, it can be removed if, if necessary. Um, it is best, it has been helpful in all, all, all degrees of sleep apnea. Someone has to have a body mass index of um, lower than 32 um, milligrams per or 20, 20 milligrams per kilo squared. Um, and then um, the other thing is that the um, apnea hypopnea index, I believe needs to be less than 65. So I think um, it is an alternative treatment. So if someone is tolerating sleep app, uh, you know, CPAP, or if they might have another mechanism by which they can get their, their sleep apnea treated, such as with an oral appliance um, for mild to moderate sleep apnea, trying a lot of times people do opt for that, um, but that does have to, you know, require um, a, 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 a very a, a, a very cognizant discussion about that. Um, one of the challenges with it sometimes is that um, if people have insomnia, so problems falling asleep and staying asleep, they may or may not be able to tolerate it quite as well, um, just because sometimes it, the device itself, how it works is that it stimulates the hypoglossal nerve, which stimulates the nerve to the tongue and protrudes the tongue forward. Um, people can feel the tongue move and sometimes that can contribute to problems um, falling asleep and staying asleep because of that, that perception. And just time for one last, I guess, part of that discussion is around oral appliance effectiveness and insurance coverage. And, and what do you find in your practice? So again, oral appliances are best for mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea. Um, 
we typically ask, I typically ask, um, it, whether or not they have a history of jaw pain or TMJ, because what it does is that, again, it pushes that lower jaw forward, opens up the airway spaces, and co can put a lot of stress on that TMJ joint. Um, what we normally do is that we can refer them to a dentist and they who specializes in that. Um, and it can be effective. Now, over time, it does have side effects. So it can cause jaw pain. It can cause um, a change in one's um, bite um, and dentition. So those are some things, some things to, to counsel about. Um, sometimes what we've done is we've used it in, in combination therapy. So if someone is on higher pressure settings for their obstructive sleep apnea and can't tolerate those, the combination of using it, the um, positive airway pressure treatment with an oral appliance allows us to decrease um, the pressure settings to have it be a little bit more tolerable. Thank you so much. I, we are out of time for questions. I know we left a few unanswered. Dr. Milano will try and give us some brief answers that we can put up with the materials for this discussion. Um, again, I want to thank Dr. Milano for being with us today and all of you for attending and for all of your excellent questions and engagement. Dr. Bolin. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Milano and Dr. Zach. That was fantastic. Um, just some wrap up kinds of things. Um, just a reminder, if you're doing CME, we do need you to actually register and indicate you want CME. So you can go to this QR code or in the chat, there's a URL to make sure if you needed to register for that. And we will send out a separate survey so you can claim credit sometime in the next week from Kathy Sullivan. And then we have a survey that will pop up right at the end of this and also be emailed to you right away. That survey is not CME, but just so we can get your feedback for future events and how we can do um, improve or add content. And just uh, upcoming, we have another ECHO series on health equity and cardiovascular risk that's coming up on September 14th. It's a 12-week series. We have expert-led didactics uh, for about 10, 15 minutes, and then we have you uh, primary care teams that join that will bring their cases um, and do case-based learning. If you are interested in that, we still have a couple openings, um, and it's Thursdays, 8 to 9 in the morning. So it seems far off in September, but if you have interest, I know it takes a while to sometimes block schedules, so definitely um, look at our website and register if you are interested. And there are some free CME credits for that as well. And just uh, again, thank you everyone for joining. Um, go to our website. We have lots of other resources there. If you're interested, we will be posting the webinar and slides uh, soon um, on our website as well, so that if any of you wanted to go back to that or, or hear more, um, it will be available for you. So thank you everyone for joining and have a wonderful rest of your day.